manner, and he argues that it will probably break up through scales. In other words, you'd have ubiquitous body wear, ubiquitous room wear, ubiquitous building wear, ubiquitous street wear, neighborhood wear, city wear, state wear, and global wear. And then they might not kind of stack perfectly in the way that you've got, say, Google search on your laptop and also Google. I mean, maybe it would sort of crack up to sort of like PCs, mainframes, etc. I'm not sure that's the case, uh, but it didn't occur to me until he mentioned it that that seemed plausible. I'm weighing this as an argument. It's actually a fascinating debate. You know? I'm not sure there's one way to do it. My suspicion is that there might be lots of ubiquities instead of one. Not necessarily one universal code where everything is in the same place, but perhaps rival codes. It might be an EU code, US code, metric version, British pounds version. You might have Yahoo rules the earth versus Google rules the earth, search engines and competition. Point of fact, it might advance more rapidly that way. Or you might have a European dirigiste model where it's sort of all given through from Brussels and written into the Aquis communitaire. You know, these are almost at the point of being, you know, serious discussions. And, uh, you know, in labs, they're, they're, they're kind of happening. Okay, here's another twist. Next slide, please. This is a realizer. Let me explain to you, and it's German, but let me explain to you why I think this has some bearing on the subject. You might not think this has anything to do with ubiquitous computation, because, you know, it's just a big object. But this is a device which is a digital forge. It's using bits of steel and then melting them together at the crossing of two laser beams. And if you see these lattices in the corner, these came out of this structure in a single piece. Right? In other words, it's casting this sort of galvanized three-dimensional void, which is not plastic or plaster or something else. That is steel. And it is made from a virtual plan for an object in a single step. In other words, you simply input the plan in the way that, say, Gary would input the plan to <coughs> shape a sheet of titanium. And instead of just getting like a sail-shaped thing that you can put on the Disney Hall for sound, you get really rather elaborate and sophisticated objects in a single pass. I mean, you're, you start with dust and lasers, and you end up with forged steel. And this is commercially available now. This is not a sci-fi speculation. This is an ad. And they don't call it the realizer for nothing. It's an object that makes virtual plans real in a single step. Now, when you throw this thing into the mix, it gets a little freaky, quite frankly. Because now you're in a situation where you could have a virtual plan of an object that has a single ID in a database so it can be searched all over the world, annotated, tagged, criticized, commented, that has a virtual plan for its design which can be attached also to the commentary, maybe even built into the object, and then it has the ability to be built by a realizer in a single step. Now, if you add all these things up together, you come up with a new post-industrial paradigm in which objects are virtual most of the time and actual occasionally. Because the object can vanish, but the code that supports the object does not vanish. And the metadata that was generated by the object does not vanish either. So physical objects become <coughs> instantiations of virtual processes. Now, there's one item missing, recyclability. If you can somehow melt this thing down at the end of the supply chain and feed it back to the front, we're suddenly into an industrial world which is completely detached from the prospects of pollution. It cleans up after itself, and it's mostly virtual and occasionally physical. That's a new idea. I don't know if it's plausible, but I don't see anything physically impossible about it. It doesn't violate laws of physics, 
doesn't go against the laws of thermodynamics. It does not require artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. Another version of the realizer there. You can see them boasting. A new rapid tooling machine that for the first time makes it possible to produce 100% dense metal parts from customary metal powder. You know, I'd love to have one of these. <laughs> it costs a lot now, but you know, how much does a laser printer cost? This is a laser printer. It prints three-dimensional objects in steel, right? Just like the powder, you know, for a laser printer. Melts little plastic powder and attaches them to the sheet of paper. This melts plastic powder and attaches it to other kinds of metal powder. I don't see any reason in principle that this thing couldn't cost about as much as a laser printer. And steel dust is cheap. Really cheap. Next slide, please. This is a fabric. This was made by one of my students at Art Center. He just stuck his hand into a scanner and had the scanner automatically kind of read the three-dimensional outlines of his hand. Then he shrunk it down by a factor of five and printed it out. That's his hand. And that's a quarter, small American coin, about the size of a 50, oh wait, you're Swiss. <laughs> All right, Frank coins, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know your bizarre local equivalent, but let's just say it's a small. <laughs> <laughs> the key scheme here is that um, he didn't actually have to make plans for his hand. He simply scanned them. And you can do that. I mean, you don't even have to invent the virtual plans for objects. You can simply use photogrammetry, take pictures of them from a couple of angles, figure out what they look like, have them output as plans, and then make them with fabs. It's just like another barrier to entry that kind of vanished somewhere in the digital haze. You know, they've had these things for years. And it's very strange. I mean, people who aren't used to fabs and fabbing find this a very ominous and weird picture. In point of fact, this is not a new technology. You know, it's years old. I mean, recently, the ability to like move it from, from ABS plastic, which is this, and into steel, I mean, that was an advance, German advance. But, you know, it's an advance. And this is a common thing. This is not, you know, this is not a far out scheme. I mean, this is just like sitting there in the lab. You know, this kid's no genius. I mean, he's a pretty good designer. <clears throat> so, let's see how we're doing here. I don't know, right?